Brother Devin Frost is going to be preaching this morning. Good morning. morning. Wet morning. If I could just add my two cents um, as far as the price is going away. I'm praying, uh, and if if you really love them too, you'll pray the same thing, that they won't have any trouble. Um, Pastor's been working uh, tirelessly on that camper, and uh, I just prayed that the Lord give them uh, a good two and a half, maybe three weeks, and that... um, there wouldn't be any problems with their vehicle, there wouldn't be any problems with the camper, that they'd just get a good time of rest. And um, if, if you love them, you'll pray for that. And I just ask, I just challenge you just to pray for that continually, that uh, while they're on their break, that they just get a good time of rest. They've done a lot of work this summer, and if you've been seeing those boxes diminish, then you know it. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a lot of work to pass out New Testaments, I know, because um, uh, I do it. And uh, I think we were able to get uh, four boxes out. I just got a small little car. Uh, but I was able to take Devin with me on Thursday, and uh, we got, I think it was two, two boxes, I think, maybe two and a half boxes out, and then on Friday, uh, we got another two and a half, two, two boxes out, so that makes it about four, four and a half boxes. And if you'll bring your car, uh, we can uh, have two more people maybe in there, or maybe four, and we can bring another bunch of boxes. So if you got any time this week and um, you'd like to come up with us, I won't be taking the church bus, so I can't take a whole lot of people, but I, I'd like to take you. Uh, numbers... 13, and I'll just keep talking while you're turning their numbers, 13. I um, had a lot of fun in Miami Beach. I saw a lot of, a lot of things. Uh, doesn't seem very different to me than where I grew up, just a little richer. I grew up in South Florida. And so, um, but there's a, there's a great need there, just like there's a great need uh, in Lake Worth and West Palm Beach, uh, all around the world. Um, there's a great need of people, uh, laborers, those that preach the gospel, that um, would teach the good news. Numbers 13, um, we're going to be uh, preaching. I don't really have a message titled Tony, but it, it's kind of interesting some of the titles he's given, some of the messages that I've preached. <laughs> he's kind of creative. Um, so I guess I'm going to think of one right now, Tony. Um, missing God's best. So that um, it kind of goes along with what I'm talking about. Uh, many people have their own idea of what life is all about. They have their own uh, saying it, I was in Miami Beach, and I tell you what, I saw some really fancy homes. I saw a lot of things that um, probably no one in this church will ever ever have. I, I saw a lot of uh, rich homes, but there was two in particular. One, it was a white building, and I tell you what, it just kept going and going and going. It was covered in cedar. I thought I was looking at Solomon's Temple. I mean, there was a fountain flowing out, out of the front of it. There was a gate higher than me. And I, I just couldn't stop looking at it. I'm going from house to house, and I take another glance at it. It was pretty. It was beautiful. Um, I'm never going to own a home like that. Um, and I wouldn't say that if you offered me a home like that, that I wouldn't take it. But, you know, I'll never be sad if I never get a home like that um, because I don't, I don't want one. I mean, if you, if you came up to me and you offered me that, that immaculate home, if you offered me Solomon's uh, palace to live in, I, I wouldn't necessarily turn it down. I mean, it'd be great to grow up in a place like that. But that's not what life is all about. Um, and I think you'd agree with that. A lot of people think life is, is about that house, and it's about building um, a, a life here. It's about building a, uh, a legacy, building something that can last forever in their own eyes. But it's good to live for Christ. And I'll tell you, if you ever spend any of your life living for the Lord, you'll say there's nothing better than living for the Lord Jesus. Because living for Christ for me has been the, it's given me a purpose in life. It's given me a direction. And I'll tell you what, that if I could have it any other way, I wouldn't want it. If I could have living for the Lord Jesus, if I could have serving Christ versus all of the riches, all the kingdoms, all the mansions of the world, I wouldn't take it. I wouldn't trade it. Why? Because there's just something about living for the Lord. And I hope you know that today. You know, the sad thing is, though that's true, though that uh, I'd say there's nothing better than living for Christ, there's nothing better than surrendering your life and just serving Him. You know, a lot of people never find what God truly desires for them in their life. Or better yet, another way to put it, uh, many people never get to, to see at the end what it was that God really wanted for them. Not necessarily in this life, but, but even further than that. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today. 
But so many people miss out on what God wants for them. And I, I'd like to ask you this question. I just want you to think about it. Why? What, what is it? Why, why don't people uh, ever reach that point? We're going to look at a story today, another one. I, I want to preach a message out of Numbers 13 about a, a group of people that missed everything that God wanted for them. And I want us to figure out what it was that they missed and how that applies to you and me. And I want us to see why it was that they missed it. Numbers 13 is a very uh, well-known story um, of the children of Israel, particularly the generation directly coming out of the Exodus. If you've ever read the Exodus, and this is important if you've ever read it, because um, if you've ever read the things that God did, they, this is very close to what's happening right now. They had just, I mean, maybe weeks, maybe months, just seen God part the Red Sea. All of the miracles, God had followed these very people in a cloud. The quail, I think it was two chapters before, had uh, fed them. And at the end of this, you're going to see that they tempted him ten times during all this, during all these miracles, during all the things that are going on. They've come now to the wilderness of Paran. Uh, different people have different ideas where that wilderness was. We know for sure it was somewhere near Kadesh Barnea, because that's what the Bible tells us. Um, somewhere in the Negev. Um, and we pick up, I think, right after the story of Miriam uh, and Aaron uh, being cursed because of uh, their rebuke to Moses. Ch chapter 13, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses. Actually, one verse to pick up the context of, of who Moses is. During this time of rebuke in chapter 12, uh, God says of Moses, now the man Moses was a very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. And if you could just, uh, that'll help you kind of get to the flow of uh, what the Lord thought about Moses. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel, of every tribe of their fathers, shall ye send a man, every one a ruler among them. And Moses, by the commandment of the Lord, sent them from the wilderness of Paran. All those men were heads of the children of Israel. All these were the names. <clears throat> and we're not going to read the whole names, but uh, I do want you to look at verse 16. These are the names of the men which Moses sent to spy out the land. And Moses called Hoshea, the son of Nun, Yehoshea, which means uh, the first God is salvation, but Jehovah is salvation. That's interesting, isn't it? That's interesting, isn't it? Because as they go out into this, uh, this vast land to search it out, God names one of them, Jehovah is salvation. I forgot to pray at the beginning, so we'll pray and we'll just keep going uh, from that point. Father, thank you for uh, this passage and for, uh, God, an opportunity to just to preach it. Lord, I pray that um, you'd just use it in my life, continue to uh, this morning. I pray for these uh, this church family, that you'd have your hand on their lives, that you'd, uh, you'd speak to them from your Holy Spirit. Teach us what you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Joshua. Joshua. Yehoshia. Jehovah is salvation. And as they go into this land, God is impressing unto Moses, or better yet, Moses is impressing unto these 12 spies that when you go, remember, Jehovah is your salvation. And that's going to be important as you begin to see where they go. Do you know that uh, most of us know this already, but just for, for sake of context, it really wasn't God who wanted these men to go, and it wasn't a bad thing that they went. Uh, not, Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 22, uh, we find later that uh, the children of Israel knew that God wanted them to go into the land. And they said unto God, Allow us before we go into the land to send forth uh, men to go before us. They wanted uh, men to go before them. Why? Because they wanted to prepare for what God had for them. And they said, we want these men to go before us and to look at the mountains and look at all the cities and um, to see how we're supposed to take it, to see the best route for us to go about it. We want to go and we want to verify everything. You know, there's nothing wrong with proving God. There's nothing wrong with going about uh, in your life and looking ahead and, and just wondering how things are going to be and how it's all going to work out. It's a great thing. And you know what's said in Deuteronomy 1 that Moses, that pleased him. Why? Because it showed initiative. It showed the fact that they were going to move forward and that they were going to do what God wanted them to do. And so here they are. They're at the border of, the, of, of Canaan, right in Kadesh Barnea, ready to go. 
and take everything that God had for them. And they sent out these spies. Moses sent them, verse 17, to spy out the land of Canaan and said unto them, Get you up this way southward and go up into the mountain and see the land, what it is and the people that dwell therein, whether they be strong or weak, few or many, and what the land is that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad in the cities that they dwell in, whether in tents or in strongholds, and what the land is, whether it be fat or lean, whether there be wood therein or not, and be of good courage, and bring of the fruit of the land. Now the time was uh, the time of the first ripe grapes. So they went up and searched the land from the wilderness of Zin to Rehov, as men come to Hamath, and they ascended by the south and came unto Hebron, and Achamin and Shishai and Talmai, the children of Anak, were. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. And they came unto the brook of Eshcol, and cut down from thence a branch of, with one cluster of grapes. And get this, and they bear it between two upon a staff. And they brought of the pomegranates and of the figs, Verse 24, the place was called the brook of Eshcol because of the grapes which the children of Israel cut down from thence, and they returned from searching of the land after many, or excuse me, after 40 days. And it seemed all was well. I mean, they go up in, into these mountains, and 40 days in the land, I want to go to New Zealand for three months, and if I have an opportunity sometime, I'd like to tell you uh, all of the things that we want to do while we're over there. But here these, these uh, 12 men are. They've had the opportunity to scan the entire land of Canaan, probably the size of Florida, at least the, the, the little end tip there. And they look at all of the nations, all the different people that were there. And the Bible says that the land was full. Can you imagine a cluster of grapes the size so large that you need two people on a, on a big rod to carry it? I tell you what, grapes are my favorite fruit. And if I saw a cluster of grapes, that, that would just be astounding. Do you know that some of the largest grapes in the world are, are found in the nation of Israel? I found that astounding when I figured that out. I don't know if it's actually the, the, the place that harvests the largest grapes. I can't verify that. But I know that they have a very good crop in Israel, even to this day when they harvest their fruit. So when these people go, they find of the figs. And you know what they find uh, of the pomegranates? They bring it back, and then in verse 26, and they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them of the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey. And this is the fruit of it. And it was exactly what God said it would be. And you know, friend, when God says that if you serve him, if you give your life to him, that he's going to bless you, you know when you do that, God blesses you. And you know that everything God says is going to be, it always ends up being that way, doesn't it? Do you know that the Bible says that uh, blessed is the man that doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly, doesn't stand in the way of sinners, doesn't sit in the seat of scornful? And you know the person that actually does that, he doesn't uh, sit in the seat of scornful, he doesn't do those other things. You know that the Bible says it, and you know what? Those men are blessed. And I've met those kind of people. They're blessed. Why? Because when God says it, it really is. And in this case, he, they prove him. They go and they see the land, and it's full. I love what it says in verse 27. The Bible says it's a land flowing with milk and with honey. And that's important because milk is, um, where does milk come from? comes from cows. It comes from cattle. I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 11. Deuteron I'm sorry, yep, chapter 11. Milk, does someone say it comes from grass? I guess in a sense it does, doesn't it? <laughs> I never thought. But I guess where does grass come from? So milk comes from the Lord if we keep thinking backwards. Okay. The land that God gave them was a land of cattle. And this is just a side note here, what we're turning to. But I find this exciting. Because as I was reading the Deuteronomy, as someone showed me this one day, they're coming out of the land of Egypt. And if you know anything about Egypt, Egypt is running along the, the Nile River. One thing that Egypt never struggled with 
They never struggled with crops. They were a desert country. And if you figure out where they were at those days, <laughs> there's snow, it doesn't rain there. It doesn't rain in Egypt. It's dry. And yet they always had grain. Do you remember the, when there was a drought? Where did the people come? They came to Egypt. And I know that's because Joseph told them that. And they stored it ahead. But there's a principle there with Egypt. Egypt never needed to seek the Lord for anything because they had the Nile River. And if you find out where they grew their crops, if you ever look at where Egypt at the time uh, of the Exodus would, would have grown their crops, it would have been along the Nile River. Why? Because that was where all the water is. And you know, year-round they could grow a crop and never had a struggle. They didn't need one rainfall. Why? Because the Nile. You know, the, a lot of the gods that they had were the gods of the river. Why? Because they worshipped the Nile because the Nile took care of them. The Nile was there for them. The Nile provided for them. And you know what God says? The land that I'm taking you to, look in chapter 11 of Deuteronomy. But your eyes, in verse 7, have seen all the great acts of the Lord which he did. Therefore shall you keep all the commandments of the Lord which I command you. Skip down um, verse 9, and that ye may prolong your days in the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give unto them and to their seed into the land flowing with a uh, land flowing with milk and honey. Verse 10, for the land whither thou goest in to possess it. It's not a land as the land of Egypt, from whence he came out, where thou sowest thy seed and waterest it with thy foot as a garden of herbs, hence the Nile. But the land whither ye go to possess it is a land of hills, it's a land of valleys, and drinketh the water of the rain of heaven. A land which the Lord thy God careth for. The eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it from the beginning of the year even unto the end of the year. You know what the Bible says there? You can turn back to Numbers uh, chapter 13. God says, I'm not giving you a land like Egypt. The land that I'm sending you to, you know where it relies on? It relies on the rain. And if you keep reading in that passage, God wanted them to be in a land, a land of cattle, a land where they would learn to shepherd. Why? Because there would be lambs and sheep where later they'll learn the truths of shepherding, which God will use to show them the fact that he is their shepherd. They, he puts them in a land where they have to rely on him, rely on the rain, rely on him by faith. And he says, it's a land flowing with milk and honey. Why? Because I take care of this land, and I'm giving it to you. It's yours. I've promised it to you. And you know what? It was exactly what God wanted it, said it would be. They brought back the figs. They brought back the pomegranates. And they bring it to Moses. And you know, would you know, we found grapes there. We found a cluster of grapes. We found figs, pomegranates. Verse 28. Nevertheless. Nevertheless. And this is where it turns here. <coughs> the people be strong that dwell in the land. And the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. Uh, we don't have time to preach on Caleb this morning. I, I, I love Caleb, verse 30. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are able to overcome it. And I find this kind of interesting. Do you know that Joshua becomes the star from this point out? After the book of Deuteronomy and Moses passes off the scene, the, the, the book is his hand to Joshua. And yet, you know, what's so astounding is that when you read in this passage, when you read uh, of the, the issue in the wilderness, you know, Joshua's mentioned, his name is mentioned. At the end, um, he's mentioned in the sense that, you know, he was there and he, he stood up for the Lord. But the man that's really focused here is Caleb. Why? Because Caleb actually believed the Lord. Caleb actually wanted to, to pursue what God had for him. Caleb actually wanted to see what God could do in that land. Caleb alone in this verse says, We are a, well able to overcome it, but the men, verse 31, that went up with him said, We be not able to overcome it against the people. Why? For they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched under the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. <clears throat> and there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. Basically, 
what God wanted. We know what God asked for, but it can't be done. Those giants that are in the land, all of, the, all of those difficult cultures, you know what they said in the verses? There was this fruit, but you know, they have walled cities. I mean, these people are huge. There's giants in the land, and, and there's the, the Amalekites are there. They, they saw the, the children of Anak are there, the, the Jebusites. Oh, man, look at all the people. We're not going to be able to face them. Why? Because we're just a bunch of grasshoppers. Oh, man, we can't do this. Caleb alone said we could. Yes, we can. When we tell God his way is too hard and we can't do it, you know what we're basically saying to the Lord? You know what you're saying when you say, God, you know what? I just can't do it. We look at uh, what God wants and we know what God ha- is asking us to do with our life. We know where uh, Christ is asking us to give these things up. You know, that sin, it's just in my life and I just can't get rid of it. I've tried so many times. I just can't give it up. You know what we're saying? We're saying, God, you lied. I know you said I can overcome this land, Lord. I know you said I could do this, but God, it's just too much. They're just too big. It's just too far. I just can't give that one up. I can give this up. I can go this far. But when it came down to it, we're just not able to do it. Ten spies come back. We are outnumbered. And God lied to us. He deceived us. There's giants in the land. <clears throat> and then the Bible says in chapter 14, and all the congregation wept. They heard the, the, heard the testimony of Canaan, they, or not Canaan, of Caleb. They heard the testimony of the men, and the Bible says for the tenth time, they weep. And their voice, and they cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured, against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt? Or would God that we had died in this wilderness? And wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return to Egypt? And in that light, just the, the normal Christian that just won't take that next step. You know what their resolve is? Verse number four. And they said one to another, let us make a captain. And let us return to Egypt. You know, a lot of people will serve Christ to a point. It's just like that parable with the sower who's sowing his seed. Some of those seeds, they fell on stony ground. And you know what the Bible says? That they believed. They believed for a while. I believe those are believers. I really do. They believed. But you know what happened when trial and tribulation came? They fall away. They turn their back. Let us make a captain. Let us go back into Egypt. Let us return. You know what the Bible says they did? I think it was Psalm 90, maybe 92. They hardened their hearts. We're going to look what they did specifically in a little bit. But they wouldn't go in. They wouldn't do what God wanted them to do. They wouldn't labor for him. They wouldn't move forward. And I'll tell you something, believer. You can, you can do so much for the Lord, but there comes a point where there's going to be sacrifice. There's going to come a point where there's going to require some faith. And you know these people, when it was easy, you know, when the quail was coming, actually, I think that was a curse on them, wasn't it? Didn't he curse them when they ate the quail? When the manna was coming, You know, it was okay. But now it's going to require some effort on my part. Now it's going to require some work. And, you know, they start to think back into Egypt. And, you know, the insanity of that. They just destroyed. I always think, you know, what would have happened had they tried to go back to Egypt? They destroyed the entire army. Well, I mean, God did that. But can you imagine after losing an entire army that these slaves come back and we serve you? There had been a massive slaughter that day. But somehow the devil was able to deceive people and think, you know, if I just go back, I remember when it was easier back there. I remember with the leeks and the onions and the garlic. I remember how easy it was. And they turn, they want to go back. You know, many people are like that. A lot of Christians are like that. You know, they'll come to a point and they're just, you know, I just don't want to go that route. God, it just can't be done. Lord, I just don't have the strength. Let us return and so the 
The passage reads on here that Moses and Aaron fell on their faces, and the, the Bible tells us that basically Caleb and Joshua pleaded with the people, and they said, you know, guys, we, we don't do this thing. Come on, God, God is with us. We can do it. I think even in one of the verses it says, look, at uh, verse Verse number seven, the land which we go through to search it, it's an exceeding good land. Can you see their hearts, these two men? If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land. Now that's faith. And give it to us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel ye not against the Lord. And they played with the congregation. But all the men in verse 10, excuse me, all the congregation bade stone them with stones. And we didn't have time to go through the book of Numbers. We didn't have time to see their complaining. But most of you know the story. This is the, this is the, the climax of it. God's had enough. And you know, friend, there comes a point in life when the Lord just does, it's enough. It's enough. I, I, I've been patient. I've been long-suffering. But there is a point when it's just too far. And the Lord said unto Moses in verse 11, how long will this people provoke me? And how long will it be ere they believe me? For all the signs which I had showed un among them, I will smite them with pestilence and disinherit them and will make of thee a greater nation and a mightier one than they. We're not going to read through the, the, the plea of Moses, but I want to kind of just bring it together here because I learned something. Not something I didn't know, but in the passage it really... It kind of humbled me a little bit when I first started studying Numbers 13. Moses defends them. God, look, I know these people have done bad. But do you, can you just imagine, he, he says in, in, in verse 14, uh, they're going to tell it to the inhabitants of the land, for they'll, they have heard that the Lord art among us, uh, basically uh, going down. Uh, he says that if, if you destroy this people, God, uh, Egypt's going to see it. The nations around about are going to see it. All the other people that saw you deliver them, they're going to see it. They're going to see all the things that you had done for them, you provided for them, and now you've destroyed them. Why? And they're going to say, Lord, the reason that... Or they're going to say the reason he did that is why? Because he couldn't bring them into Egypt or into the land of Canaan. That God, that that God, their God wasn't able to do it. And he says, Lord, for that reason, just so your name wouldn't be misspoken, that your name would be glorified, would you keep these people? Would you just give them mercy, Lord? Be merciful unto them. Pardon, verse 19, I beseech thee the iniquity of this people according unto the greatness of thy mercy. And as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt even until now, and the Lord said, I have pardoned it according to thy word. But look at verse 21. But as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. You know what he's saying? Moses, I'm going to do it. I'm going to forgive him. But I want to remind you about something. And friend, you ought to be reminded about this today. That whether I destroy these people or whether I pardon them, which I'm going to do for your sake, in any case, but as truly as I live, as long as I'm God and as long as I live, destroy them today, destroy them not. God says this, I'm going to be glorified. All the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. You know, friend, God doesn't need you. And though Moses gave that, that noble plea, and though God ended up doing it anyways because he's such a good God and it did bring him glory, God says your argument is invalid. Because had I destroyed them, you know what? All the earth would still be filled with my glory. And that humbled me. Because sometimes I'll pray, Lord, would you just use me? <laughs> even though I'm not worthy. Even though I know I failed here. God, even though I did this and I've embarrassed myself and I've embarrassed you. God, would you just use me in spite of me? Why? So that you'd be... Because then you could be glorified. Why? That you could use me and you could still receive the glory. You know what God's saying here? Devin, I'll use you. I'll be merciful. But don't forget, I don't need you to be glorified. I don't need you to have my glory fill the earth. If I destroyed you, I'd still be glorified. And that humbled me because there have been times in my life where I know it. I have prayed that exact prayer that, God, I'm sorry. You know what you ought to be praying? If the Lord will, we shall live. If the Lord will, I'll live and do this and that. God, you'll be glorified with or without me. You could destroy me. 
you could be merciful on me. It really doesn't matter. I'm just asking for grace. And you know what he's trying to teach Mer uh, Moses here? And later, he'll teach him the same thing. I'll be merciful unto whom I will be merciful. And I'll... Ha uh, the rest of that verse... Um, yeah, that's a good verse. <laughs> I was going somewhere with that. I'll be... What's the rest of that verse, Al? I'll have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I'll... I'll harden whom I will I harden. And if you look at the context of that passage, I believe he was asking for mercy again there. He was asking for some, something for the Lord to do. He wanted to see his backside. And he gave him all these reasons why. And God said, I'm going to do it. But Moses, don't forget that I'm not doing it because of the reasons you gave me. Whether I do it or whether I don't, it's going to be because I, I do what I want to do because I'm God. <clears throat> and that humbled me when I read this passage. I wasn't even looking for it. It was a side note. But these, this generation, it had to suffer because of what it did. Verse 22. Because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times, and have not hearkened to my voice, surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. Of course, Caleb gets to see it in verse 22, but uh, look at verse 28 for time. Say unto them, as truly as I live, verse 28, saith the Lord, as ye have spoken in mine ears, so will I do to you. Your carcasses shall fall in the wilderness. They never got to see and you know what? I want you to turn to the book of Hebrews. The Hebrews chapter 4. They never got to see what God had for them. You know, it wasn't necessarily the land of Canaan. Because when they get into the land, when their children get into the land, all they're going to find is war. All they're going to find is the battles. But it's going to come at the end of those battles. It's going to come at the end of the wars. And this generation will never get to see what God wanted for them in the end. Many will never, they'll never know what Christ really ultimately desired for them for one reason. We just won't trust him. We won't come to the point where we say, God, if, if this is really what you want, I'm just going to do it. I don't understand it. I don't know why, but Lord, I want to be used. And God, I want to get the end. I want to get to the end. And I want to see what you have for me. I said at the beginning of the message that, you know, it's really not that, that house, it's, it's, it really doesn't matter. Why? Because it's not really what you get in this life. It really doesn't matter who has the bigger home or who has more success because what really matters is uh, at the end of our race. And this exact story becomes a perfect illustration, a perfect depiction of another generation of Jewish believers. If I ever find Hebrews, it's before James who has come to the point where they're ready to go back. They've been persecuted so much, they can't handle it anymore. They're ready to forsake the assembling of themselves. They're, they're ready to go back. And this is a very unique generation. Uh, ever since the first century, there was no Jewish temple. But for this specific people, for this, these believers, the interesting thing is that there actually was a temple. And so it was complicated for them sometimes. And they couldn't take it, the, the pressure anymore. That's what I get when I, when, I, when I read this. And a lot of them are, are wanting to go back. And so God has the writer of Hebrews basically just, I mean, there's a lot going on in here, and I wish, I wish we could just talk about it. If you guys want to stay, uh, we can. Um, but Hebrews chapter 3, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost, verse 7, as the Holy Ghost saith, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. In the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily. While it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin, for we are made partakers, literally partners. Uh, 
that same word, partakers, is translated in Corinthians as fellowship. We have become, it's a perfect verb, it's, it's a perfect noun. We have become partakers and will continue to have fellowship partners. We will continue to be with Christ, partaking of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said today, if you'll hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. For some, when they heard, did provoke talking about that generation. Howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses, remember Caleb and Joshua, but with whom was he grieved 40 years? Was it not with them that sinned? His carcasses fell in the wilderness. They never saw what God wanted them to see. And to whom swear he that they should not enter, not Canaan, but after the wars, for them his rest. But to them that believed not, literally that word there, um, it's believed not, but it's a special word. It's actually uh, very uh, literally the word disobedience. To them that disbelieved, that disobeyed. So we see that they could not enter in because of disobedience, because of unbelief. Let us therefore fear. And I'm getting to something here, so just, just bear with me. Lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest. Any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. The gospel for them was the land of Canaan, the good news for them. The good news for us is the salvation of Christ and the fact that we get to come uh, unto God by him, our high priest. Verse 1, we learn that of chapter 3 of Hebrews, that Christ, for this, these believing uh, Jewish people, he's their high priest. And they can come unto God by him. They don't need the old covenant. They don't need the Old Testament. We're getting to something. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but unto them uh, the good news of entering into the rest of Canaan uh, did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Skip down. Well, let's read this verse. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I swore in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake, and this is this verse, and then I'll... Uh, probably skip down in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise. Focus on this verse. And God did rest on the seventh day from all his works. Verse 9. There remaineth therefore a rest. And I know I'm talking a lot about words in this passage, but this word is, for rest is very different from every other word that talked about rest throughout all the other parts of this book. It's the only time it's mentioned. It's literally, if I could bring it from where, when it was, before it was brought into English, it literally is a Sabbath rest, the seventh day. There remains, therefore, a rest, a Sabbath rest to the people of God. For he that has entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter that rest, that Sabbath rest, lest any man fall after the same manner of unbelief. We read in verse number four something. God worked six days. He labored for six days, and on the seventh day he had a Sabbath. And the Bible is using in the book of Hebrews a picture, an, not an allegory, an illustration. I don't know if that's the perfect word. It's not an illustration. These people were to enter into the land of Canaan. They were to labor. They were to work. They were to toil. And then at the end would come rest. God labored for six days in creation, and it was at the seventh day that God rested. And God has been resting ever since the seventh day of creation. Did you know that? Isn't that interesting? That God labored six days. Here we are toiling, asking God to do something, hoping that God will work, and yet God's been resting ever since creation. And he says that you can enter into my rest. You know what he says? He says in verse 11, let us labor. Why? Because rest comes at the end of the fight. Because rest comes to the person who finishes the race. And you know, so many Christians, they will never get to see everything that God wanted for them at the judgment seat. They'll never get to see everything that they could have had as far as a reward if they just endured. Do you want that crown of righteousness that doesn't fade away? Do you want to finish your course? I do. I do. Or do you want to toil in the wilderness? And you want to miss out on everything that God has for you <clears throat> after this life. We're not talking about salvation here. We're talking about finishing your course. We're talking about the, 
the rest that abides, that remains unto this day to the people of God, to those that are faithful. Let us labor. But you know the sad thing is, is that most people will never, will never earn that. Why? Because Paul said, I finished my course. I've kept the faith. I've endured. Henceforth is laid up for me a crown of righteousness that fadeth not away. And friend, I want that crown. I want to earn what he earned. And we're not talking about salvation. We're talking about, can I use the word honor? Being able to stand before him with a handful of things that you did for him and saying, Lord, I finished what you had for me. These people turned back. They turned their eyes back. And friend, if I could just spend a little more time in Hebrews and we can't do that, you'd learn from this book that you can't go back. That you can't turn back. That there is no going back. What will you do? Father, I pray that you would give me a fervor to just push to the end of my course, Lord, and that you'd allow me to finish the race. Lord, I don't want to be a castaway. I don't want to be a branch thrown aside. I want to stay on the vine. And God, I beg you to use my life. I beg you to use this uh, church body. Every one of these church members, Lord, I beg you to use their lives. I pray, Lord, that you'd continue to guide us, to help us, Lord, to grow. I pray um, that you'd send forth laborers out of this ministry. And Lord, I pray that we wouldn't uh, lose any to the world. I pray that you'd work on hearts today and that you'd have your way. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Brother Chris, I'm going to hand it over to you. I want to have an invitation here this morning. Turn in your hymn books to page 375. I gave my life for thee. Well, I'll go ahead and stand. Uh, turn to page 375. Um, the invitation this morning is basically an invitation... And I've been being invited to act on what God spoke to you about this morning. Um, and uh, the service through the Word of God, the Holy Spirit, if He spoke to you and He told you something you need to do and something you need to change in your life, maybe, right now would be when to get it right. You can uh, maybe sit in your seat or if you need to kneel or uh, come kneel at one of these benches here, do what uh, God is telling you to do. Get right with Him what He's speaking to you about this morning. Um, today don't harden your hearts do what uh, God has for you um, go ahead and sing this song here uh, page 375 I gave my life for thee